Welcome to HBTV. I'm Harry Binswanger, a philosopher who advocates Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, applying it in an unusual way, such as we are doing today, to current events and general trends, as well as talking about philosophy directly. Today's topic is listed as Canada, but the totalitarian impulse in Canada, but that's a symbol of a wider thing that I want to talk about, which is a certain kind of fear. Not ordinary fear, but the person who's fearful of life as such, the person who goes around in fear all the time and devises various strategies to cope with that. This I'm calling metaphysical fear because metaphysical in objectivism means pertaining to life as such, pertaining to the basic nature of existence. Metaphysical fear is distinguished from localized fear and it infects the soul of many, many people. First, the intellectuals, and then the people who've been through what is laughingly called the educational system today, and which a friend of mine calls the disminding process. The reason why intellectuals are susceptible to metaphysical fear is because of the nature of the ideas that have dominated the West for the last 200 years. These are the ideas whose essence is anti-reason. Reason, Kant said, is limited. It cannot know the real truth. That became reason is up for grabs. Everybody has his own reason. There is bourgeois reason and uh, proletariat reason, Aryan reason and Jewish reason, black reason and white reason, rich. Well, that comes with bourgeois. Uh, so all kinds of collectives are supposed to have a different reason. And e each individual is thought to have his own truth, his own reality, which means there is no such thing as reason. Because reason means an objective, universally applicable faculty for knowing what is really there. If you don't believe in reason, you're going to be in trouble because you have no other tool for coping with reality. You can follow the crowd, but the crowd often turns out to be lemmings and you plunge over the cliff. You can follow the experts, but how are you to know which experts are the real experts? So if you believe that your tool of cognition is invalid, maybe we're living in the matrix. If you doubt your ability to know absolute truth, you're going to fail a lot. You're going to get hurt a lot. Reality is going to smack you in the face and you're going to feel fear. Just as if you had to walk around with your eyes shut, you would feel anxious. So the intellectuals of the last 200 years and their students today feel they are conceptually blind, they're intellectually blind, they cannot know the future, they cannot know if what plans to make, if anything, they, life is a bitch, life is chaos, there are no easy answers. In fact, there are no answers at all. Your truth is not my truth. If you hold all that material, which so many do, you're going to be frightened because you'll be out of control. You'll be, your mental eyes will be regarded as blind or as projecting something that isn't there. Maybe your brain in a vat being fed stuff. So the distrust of reason, let's put it in a generous way, 
He goes beyond distrust Dostoevsky's underground man hated the fact that two plus two is four. And he said, a wall is a wall. Why do I have to accept that? I don't want there to be a wall there. But the milder form is, well, you just can't be sure. You can't trust your reason. If you hold that, you've got to be afraid. Now, along with the distrust of reason is the absolute Chinese wall that has been erected to separate values from facts. So some intellectuals will tell you, well, yeah, there's science, and science comes up with likely hypotheses. Well, granted, it can't ever be certain about anything. Still, it can compute degrees of probability. Incidentally, that's a contradiction. Probability presupposes certainty, but they don't realize that. But values, right and wrong, good and evil, that's not the province of of, um, reason at all. They're united on that. That's absolutely over the line into the realm of faith, taboo, tradition, whim. It has nothing to do with science. There's no science of values. Even Ludwig von Mises, the great pro-capitalist, says that there's no science of values, but he's just taking it over from the cultural atmosphere of um, Germany at the time. <clears throat> so if you've banished reason from ethics, then you're going to go by the ethics that you were brought up in, the ethics that seems intuitive to you, the ethics that springs from your, quote, conscience, which means the ethics that your mother drilled into you before you were old enough to think it, or thought you were old enough to think it through. So what is that ethics? Self-sacrifice. The self is a standard of evil, Service to others or God or country as a standard of good. The good is what you are not. The good is non-you. That's what's drilled into you. My mother said, you, 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 that's all you think about, you. Now, I didn't see anything wrong with that, but um, most people would cower under that. Most people accept the ethics of service, self-sacrifice, duty, even when they cheat on it. I had a friend who worked for Goldman Sachs, the great investment banking firm of Wall Street, and she was an altruist and a leftist, which is the political expression of altruism. And I said, what are you doing here at Goldman Sachs, the pinnacle of capitalist, quote, exploitation, given your beliefs. She said, I sold out. Now, (laughs) imagine that that's your state. You either sell out and cheat and feel guilty and disgusted with yourself, or you try to be pure and can't have any values that have to be like Mother Teresa if you really take it seriously um, and live a life of of deprivation and pain and suffering. And add to that, you don't trust reason. Reason has nothing to say about values. That's what mommy says goes there. But reason in science Well, it gives you degrees of probability, but you can't ever be sure. And the disputes in science today show that they don't really think it's a matter of reason. It's a matter of what you can get a grant to pursue. So imagine you've got that. You're going to be, if you're at all consistent, frightened and leftist. Frightened and leftist. Because what is Marxism? Marx told us, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. From each according to his ability, you you do the work, you create as much as you can, and then you give it to those in need. It's not 
for you, you are to serve. Vox populi, vox dei. The voice of the people is the voice of God. Others, they have this tremendous qualification. They're not you. That makes them saintly. And the less ability and more need they have, the more they're rewarded. So it's pretty clear that, I mean, look at the whole egalitarian movement. Look at, look at the progressive movement, which is really the regressive movement. It's all about punishing the rich, stopping greed, leveling down to give the needy, the most vulnerable among us. How many times have you heard that phrase? They deserve everything. And the rich and powerful, powerful meaning power to create, deserve nothing. So uh, the implementation of unreason and altruism is statism, is collectivism, is leftism, is unlimited government power wielded for the sake of punishing the successful and rewarding those who lack values, the needy. <clears throat> so Ayn Rand observed in 1970 in an article, The Left, Old and New, February 1970, hatred of reason leads to fear of reality. Since fear has always been the intense motivational emotion of the leftists, it is fear they have always used as their chief psychological tool of propaganda, apparently in the belief that it has an irresist as irresistible power in the consciousness of others as in their own. With the destruction of capitalism as their unalterable goal, they tried at first to engender economic fear by spreading the notion that capitalism leads to general impoverishment and the concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands. How many times interjecting have you heard, the rich get rich and the poor get poorer? My God, I remember hearing that on the radio in 1964. And supposedly it's kept on going. So there should be plenty of corpses in the streets of every city, and there should only be about two rich people now. This line was somewhat successful in Europe, but not in this country where the factual evidence to the contrary was too obviously clear. The next leftist line was fear of the atom bomb, accompanied by the suggestion that we should surrender to communism without a fight in order to avoid universal destruction. Do you remember the slogan, better red than dead? I remember it, but it's long ago. This did not go over either, not in this country. And then she talks about the new fear, which is the environmental fear that we're tampering with Mother Nature. Oh, right here, I ordered on the web this copy of Newsweek magazine from 1970, January 26, 1970, The Ravaged Environment. We see it mirrored, Harry. Oh, you see it mirrored? I, I think I can flip that. Um, right here. Does, does this flip it or is it still good? Okay. The ravaged environment. And it's, you see all these cars over here? That's a pile of junk cars in a junkyard. That's going to be the future of humanity. And there's smoky smokestacks over here that are attacking the earth. And there's overpopulation and Lake Erie was dead. Uh, and it's pretty much the end of the world. I remember in 1969, Eddie Albert saying on the Johnny Carson show, it's too late now in 15 years, industrial civilization will be over. So that should have ended in 1984. You remember Eddie Albert from Green Acres? 
movie personality, a TV personality. Now we have global warming whose name was changed to climate change. Why was it changed to climate change? Because there was no warming to speak of. But there's always some bad weather event that you can say, aha, drought, that's climate change. Aha, extra snow, that's climate change. Aha, hurricane, that's climate change. So um, people deprived of their reason by the contemporary educational or disminding process, don't stop to ask themselves, how long has this been going on? This claim of global warming or climate change. And it's in this Newsweek, 1970, 51 years. And now I guess that San Francisco is underwater, isn't it? And in London, uh, London is what Las Vegas used to be, it generally highs in the 100s in the summer. And uh, places like Washington, D.C. are just completely abandoned because they're both underwater and 130 degrees C. Well, no. Actually, the climate that we perceive all around the world is the maybe a shade different than it was a hundred years ago, maybe. But Paris has the same weather it had when F. Scott Fitzgerald and Gertrude Stein was there. I came to New York in 1965, left 50 years later, same climate. I'm in Florida now. Florida is not burning up. It's the same climate it had when I was a boy. I mean, you can just go anywhere in the world and see, has there been, you know, I think there's been some little change. But if you hadn't been told there's climate change, you wouldn't notice it. You wouldn't think about it. Really? What climate change? Now, that doesn't cut any ice. That doesn't cut any ice because our authorities tell us disaster is coming and we feel it because we're afraid. We know that some disaster is coming because we can't trust ourselves. Maybe it's non-food chemicals. Maybe it's the stuff we're eating. Maybe it's climate. Maybe it's our carbon footprint. Maybe it's our selfishness that's coming to destroy us. Something is lurking out there. I feel it, something bad. So I made a list, and I'm, we're going to climax this with fear in Canada, which I just experienced last week. But I have a list, and I'm just going to run through some of the leftist and non-leftist, just general uh, regressive campaigns over the, my lifetime. Rachel Carson, The Silent Spring, phony. Banned DDT, 880 million people a year die of malaria because of Rachel Carson. So that's uh, 50 years next year. Well, it wasn't banned right away. It wasn't banned until 72. So There's 40, 39 years of about a million people dying a year that didn't have to. Now, if you look up on the web, this is fascinating. You look up on the web, Rachel Carson fraud, Google. One of the hits is an article in the LA Times saying it's a right wing myth that Rachel Carson was a fraud. So I looked into the article and it cites a 2009 study that says DDT may be associated with, and lists a bunch of just, it may be. Not that it is, not that it is even associated with, or as opposed to causes, but a 2009 study found it may be associated with higher incidence of cancer, diabetes, uh, dementia, and so forth. So I went and looked at the 2009 study. The 2009 study was conducted by an environmentalist organization, and it's not a study. It's a 
review of the literature. And it's a review of the literature only going back uh, to the 2000s. And if you look at their own, they're not totally, you know, lying to you or anything. You look at it, you read it carefully. There's not a single case in there that says anything other than the data is unclear. We need more money to do more studies. So I think um, palm trees may be associated with UFOs. And I want to grant to check. The evidence is unclear now whether, whether the number of palm trees correlates with the UFO sightings. I want a government grant. I would say $10 million to get started, and we're going to make a systematic study of the number of palm trees and the number of UFO sightings. And this will require setting up some installations around the world. And I, I want to be in charge of that because I'm the one who sounded the alarm here. I'm the whistleblower. Wait a minute, did I say palm trees? It's oak trees. It's really oak trees. That, or cactus, because a lot of the sightings are, have been in New Mexico. and De Yeah, cactus, that's it. And maybe it's not more cactus is more UFOs, but declining numbers of cactus due to the carbon footprint increasing has meant more UFO activity. I, this definitely needs a lot more work. So here you have the um, LA Times, the headline, Rachel Carson fraud dash right wing myth, saying that there may be an association between DDT and some other things, as in this study, which isn't a study and which doesn't say that and is very slant anyway. So that, that's the kind of non-science that, of uh, junk science that passes for science. Um, you're not old enough unless you're like me to remember 1957 Thanksgiving. There was a cranberry scare. Cranberries cause cancer. There was even a, a pop song, Cranberry, Cranberry Blues. Uh, haven't got much to lose. Don't have much to lose, I think was the rhyme with that. Then there was the big one from earlier, automation. Automation, now not what we think of as robots or anything, but steam shovels and big equipment in factories where one person operating a power machine like a steam shovel could do the work of 100. That's going to lead to massive unemployment. Massive unemployment. Um, so what we need is government, a government policy to combat this. Here's a quote from somebody. See if you can guess who it is. It is only in the backward countries of the world that increased production is still an important object. In those most advanced, what is economically needed is a better distribution of which one indispensable means is a stricter restraint on population. So we got enough wealth, we've got enough technology, we're advanced enough in the, in the advanced countries of the West. Who do you think said that? Paul Not, Ehrlich? Huh? Paul Ehrlich, the Malthusian oh, guy. Dream on, dream on. Nikos, I said I was going to throw it over to you to make some announcements. We'll have to do that at the end or maybe when I stop to take words. John Stuart Mill, 1848. Now, if you, if you watch 1900 House on the BBC about what it was like to live in London in 1900, they had a couple move in and try to live with it. They couldn't do it. They couldn't cope with it. There was no such thing as detergent. You washed your clothes with the lye. Just doing the laundry took three days of the week for the wife, because it was the wife who had to do it. The wash day, Monday's wash day, Tuesday was drying day, and Wednesday was ironing day. 
three days devoted to getting that done. And they didn't have broadband. They could only do about 2,400 baud back in 1848. So uh, Plato has a similar thing. He says, why do we need these luxuries like tables and beds? Why can't we just sleep on uh, boughs of trees that have been cut down, uh, which was apparently a practice. Uh, Nikos, you might know about that. Uh, I forget the tree. Uh, uh, soft boughs of trees would be put down and they'd lie on them. And plates, people demand plates, uh, luxury, luxury. We don't need plates. Let's get back to basics. Uh, and then, so it's all the time people attacking technology, attacking progress. It's not just something that the Luddites were engaged in in the Industrial Revolution. Automation was going to lead us to our doom. We needed an industrial policy. Fallout. Fallout. Now we're in the mid-50s. Fallout. Nuclear fallout. They're doing these atomic tests. And if you went to the movies, you know it made ants into giant creatures that threatened all of humanity from the radioactivity from fallout. There's songs like Strontium, Strontium 90, one of the things in the fallout, and Malvina Reynolds, what have they done to the rain? Uh, it's, it was going to destroy us all. And the solution was nuclear disarmament. We didn't call it nuclear, then we called it atomic. Speaking of nuclear, nuclear war, with the atomic bomb. Remember nuclear winter? Nuclear winter, if there was atomic weapons were used, it was gonna cloud up the sky. This was in the Iraq war. And um, all life on earth would end because it would, not enough sunlight would get through to keep plant life going and animal life depends on plant life. Well, it so happened that Saddam set all the oil fields on fire and we had more smoke than was projected in nuclear winter. It didn't make a damn bit of difference. Pollution, pollution was gonna kill us. Lake Erie is dead, there's acid rain Acid rain is eating into our very vitals. Um, there was an epidemic of cancer. Cancer is raging. There's an epidemic because we don't live in harmony with nature. Well, it turns out there wasn't any epidemic. In fact, cancer rates were going down steadily. It is true the more people lived longer due to better medical treatment. And if you live longer, you're going to die of either heart disease or cancer. HIV, HIV was going to leap into the heterosexual population and we were all going to die. I went to a conference where a panel of doctors said that. Right-wing doctors said that it's, it's now in this, the heterosexual population and it's no joke, it's frightening, it's coming here. Didn't happen. When I was young, I saw a wonderful cartoon, a kind of cartoon that you couldn't print today. It showed two cave women in the foreground talking to each other while they watched two cave men in the background who were standing in amazement in front of a fire that they had apparently made rather than it just happened. And one cave woman is saying to the other, I don't care what they say. Someday that thing is gonna get loose and burn down the whole world. Now you couldn't do that for several reasons today. Uh, the ozone hole, I'm gonna skip over because they don't really know that much about it. They can claim that it was uh, CFC banning that has shrunk the ozone hole. Um, ALAR in the apples is too small to really go into, but I think you you see the pattern. Oh, artificial intelligence now, uh, contemporarily, 
is a big problem because big tech uses it. And big tech has the power to snoop on us. So big tech can make us see ads of things we want to buy. Imagine that. In the past, we had to see ads for things like uh, home reshingling. When you rented an apartment, you still saw the home reshingling ad. Now you see something that might be good for you. Horrible, horrible. How dare they? Well, they dare because you gave them permission. But be that as it may, the, the power of big tech, the power of big tech is to give us things that we want so much that we're so happy to have that we don't want to lose them. Yeah, maybe the solution is suicide. Then you won't want anything and nobody will have any power over you. Ayn Rand distinguished economic power from political power. Economic power is the power to produce, to provide values, to offer you a deal, which you can turn down. Political power is the power to destroy you, to seize you, to take your property, to throw you in jail, ultimately to kill you. One is the power of values. The other is the power of force and coercion. They're completely opposite, but they're not distinguished today. So we have a fear of big tech, a, an issue of the magazine I Get Tech Review put out by MIT, and it's not, is this it right here? No, that's something else. It's praises young innovators who are struggling to rest, W-R-E-S-T, take away the power of big tech over AI. They're trying to make AI, artificial intelligence, available to the little guy. And the little guy is saintly because he's little, because he doesn't have ability. He has need. So Canada. Canada, I, I uh, went to Canada on the 8th. My wife and I drove in after having spent about six hours each filling out forms so that we can get in. Canada is closed to entry, but we make an exception for certain cases. And one of them is funerals or memorial services. And my good friend, John Ridpath died this spring and the memorial service was held on a lake in Algonquin Park last weekend. So I wanted to come up for that. So I had to, my wife and I did. We filled out the vaccinate proof of vaccination of two shots, two shots long ago, so that they're fully effective now. We had to get a COVID test within a narrow window of about 24 hours, not too early to be out of date, if it's older than 72 hours, and not too soon that we wouldn't get the test results back when we got to the border. We did that. We both tested negative, which was, uh, of course, we knew we would. And uh, then there's something called Arrive Can. Arrive Can, very hip. A website where you fill out all the paperwork and all the forms about who you are, why you're taking up space on the planet, what your intentions are. And then there was, that's, that wasn't all. We submitted all that, each of us, but there was a certificate of bereavement. We had to get a death certificate, which Ridpath's son sent us. We had to submit a statement about where we would be staying from the proprietor of that place. And we got a statement from the son who owns the cottage on the lake where John used to summer and it is most beloved spot and where the memorial service for the family and uh, a couple of friends were being held. So we got that. However, I didn't hit submit at the right time for that 
And when I realized that, I printed it out and took the form with me. We drove into Canada because the regulations are stricter at the airports, we've, we heard. So we drove all the way. My wife has a cottage in Maine. So I flew to Portland, Maine. We drove from Portland about 10 hours overnight. We stayed overnight in Burlington, Vermont, into Cornwall. Well, no, it was like six hours to Cornwall, Ontario, and then four more hours to where we were going in Canada. And uh, when we got there, it was a nightmare. They searched our car. I mean, I'm a 77 year old PhD, right? But who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? And who knows what I might have been bringing in? So they searched the car. They told me to go into this room where the officials were and had a can, or we went up to a border guard or whatever you call him, official. And he said, You didn't fill out your certificate. Why are you here? Why do you want to come to Canada? Uh, and I said, well, it's a bereavement, you know, it's a memorial service. We didn't get any form. I know I got it right here. I filled out. This is your form with everything filled out. I didn't hit submit. Well, I don't know. He was actually a nice fellow, personally. I'm going to have to call public health on this. Both vaccinated twice both tested within a day negative for COVID. It's going to have to, and of course we're wearing masks in there. Um, so we said, he said, go sit over there. So we sat over there for 45 more minutes. Calls us back up. He said, public health says it's in my discretion. Where are you going to be staying? Cannily, I said, that's up to you. If you tell us to stay at a hotel, we'll stay. We've got reservations at the Algonquin Inn. We can stay there. Or if you tell us to stay in a cottage, we'll stay in a cottage. And he says, you can't stay in a hotel. You have to quarantine for 14 days. And you have to be able to have a supply of food and water and facilities that don't, you know, don't involve other people. You can't stay in a hotel. So my wife says, so we should cancel the reservations at the Algonquin Inn? Yes. Uh, what are the arrangements at the cottage or cottages? I said, well, the family has a, a, whole, a whole bunch of cottages, which is true. And we're going to have our own, just Jean and me, we're going to have our own cottage to stay in, which was pretty much a lie. There was a cottage that we could have stayed in, but it hadn't been opened in two years and it was a wreck. So we didn't want to stay there. And he said, that's what I wanted to hear. Okay. If you quarantine in this cottage and you don't see other members of the family, wait, what about this memorial service? And I said, truthfully, that's in canoes, two to a canoe out on the lake. It's not it's not being held indoors and not even on the land. So the canoes will be obviously quite a bit separated from each other. You can't get canoes very close unless you hold on. Um, and he said, uh, well, you can stay at the cottage provided that you take this test. And they had a stack of blue boxes about this size. You take this test inside their instructions. It's a COVID test. And you call, you, you get on the web and go to this website and they will give you instructions and guide you through it. You must, you must go to this website and you must do it today because it was about two o'clock in the afternoon, maybe three o'clock by that time. You must do it today. Once you have finished it, you seal it and you drop it in the mail and then you're out of quarantine. What? Once you drop it in the mail, you're out of quarantine. You have to take a test. 
The test might show you have COVID, but you're okay once you drop it in the mail. Doesn't have to be picked up. Doesn't have to be looked at. Doesn't have to be sent to the lab to determine if you have COVID. All you have to do is drop it in the mail and then you can start socializing with other people. Although we weren't really sure what out of quarantine meant because Canadians stay six feet apart at all times with masks on unless they're outside. Um, so we got to the Algonquin Inn where we were not supposed to stay, but we had our friend rent a room in our name so our names wouldn't be on the register of the Algonquin Inn. And we stayed, they gave us the key and we stayed in that room. So uh, at nine o'clock, we get on the web, we go to the site, closed, closed for the night. We were told you had to do it that night. What are you going to do? So I made sure that the car was parked with the plates not showing because it had been suggested that the Canadian authorities could phone up the local police, ask them to go to the Algonquin Inn because my wife had let that name slip and see if there was a license plate so-and-so parked there. So I tried to, I wanted to park away and walk to the end, but my wife thought that was paranoid. So the next day, we go to the John Repass compound of cottages, and we get on the web. We get to the site for the test. You are number 760 in the queue. It's not quite as bad as it sounds because the queue started to go down you know, by 10 or 20 at a time. So my wife was the one, the first one to go online because we couldn't both go online. We only had one phone to serve as a hotspot. So she went online and she went about her business and about an hour and a half, two hours later, ding, someone appears. So she follows the instructions, swabs her, nasal passages with this thing, puts it in the test tube, seals the test tube, puts the test tube in the blue box we have been given. And there's this purple purolator. It's a, a delivery service like FedEx or DHL. Purolator envelope in there to put the box in. And a uh, wipe, alcohol wipe, to wipe down the surface of the purolator envelope because everybody knows you can get COVID through the mail, everybody as of March last year anyway thought that. So um, she puts hers in and then I get the phone and I call in, I'm number 800 and something in the queue. But I've learned that, you know, the queue moves. So I go about my business and I went another place and my wife comes running out with the, with the phone in her hand saying, she's there, she's there. But her running out with the phone had broken the Bluetooth connection to the phone, so I was offline. Now, the one bright spot was when I got back online, they had a facility for if your connection was broken, click here. So I didn't have to wait again. But now it's about 6 p.m. of the second day, and I go through the thing, and I put it in the envelope, and I seal it up and I put the box in the purple purolator. And now we got two purple purolator envelopes that we have to get to purolator. Well, where we are is water access only. There's no road there. You have to go in a boat from the dock for about a minute and a half in a motorboat to get to the cottages. So purolator is not going to come there. And the whole park is way off from any civilization. So we find out that Staples, the this office supply store in a town 45 minutes from the lake has a purolator drop-off place. And they open at 9 a.m. in the morning. We close at that time. We, we weren't about to get there before they close. So the next day I take the two purolator envelopes to Staples. 
and I uh, go in the door and say, where is the pure later drop off? It's over there where you see the packages on the counter. So I go over the packages on the counter and it's another Staples employee. And I say, I'm putting these pure later envelopes here on the counter of our COVID test. She says, oh, they won't pick it up. What? Pure later won't touch those. But they're in a pure later envelope. No, they won't touch that. So I had uh, seen a Canadian post box outside Staples. So I thought, you know, he originally said mail it. He didn't say anything about pure later. What if I just drop it, drop them in the mail? And I asked the employee, what if I put it in the post box out there? She said, oh, I don't think they'll do anything with that. And that they won't pick it up. So I thought, okay, sounds good to me. And I took the both the, the both the envelopes and dropped them in the mail and left. So the whole experience, I haven't told you about the Canadians. The Canadians are frightened to death. The Canadians are reacting to COVID the way we did in March or April of last year when it was new and it was decimating New York and we thought it was going to come get us. They, um, they mask all the time. There's no resistance to masks. See, in the U.S., you've got people, some crazy, some more sensible, who fight the mask. I'm not going to wear a damn it. No Canadians would do that. I mean, essentially, no Canadians. You can only go two people inside a restaurant at a time to get takeout. You cannot serve in a restaurant. Uh, I got coffee in a, in a shop and sat outside on a veranda. The waitress comes out and hands me a slip of paper. It asks for my name and phone number, because if I got COVID, they'd want to know who else I killed, you know, by contact with them so they could send bereavement notices to the family. So um, this the fact that I'm vaccinated and I tested negative a day and a half or two days before, not, none of that means anything. They are just scared. They all follow the rules. They're all docile. The thought of, of questioning does not arise. My friend said that you can wear a sign that you can buy on Amazon saying, I'm medically exempt from wearing a mask. I don't have to wear it because of my condition. And everybody is fine with that. Because that's another official thing looking. It's, it's, you know, it's phony, but they don't know that. They see the, oh, okay, he's exempt. That's fine. But they are, I, I did not know this. I've been going to Canada for 50 years in the summer. They are rules bound, dutiful, humble, frightened people. My friend John's son says he doesn't think they're going to open up for three years. Because facts don't matter to them. You, you uh, tell them, uh, you know, the United States is open and uh, COVID is down 96%. The United States had X thousand cases yesterday. We only had one tenth of that here because of our lockdown. But isn't your population one tenth that of the US? Silent, you know, I mean, they they don't they only look at the absolute numbers. Our population is 10 times that of Canada. Incidentally, uh, British Columbia is not as bad as um, Ontario and the eastern provinces because uh, there was someone there from British Columbia and they don't have to mask there. But I'm talking about the eastern provinces. Quebec is close to Ontario. You're not supposed to drive from Ontario into Quebec. So they are uh, fear and trembling sickness unto death is their motto.
from Kierkegaard. They are frightened, dutiful, head down, following. They're nice people. I mean, they're friendly. They're, they smile, but there's no independent individualist spirit there, which is why uh, they have socialist, sometimes socialist uh, uh, heads of state, at least of the provinces. Uh, I'm going to take a, a stop here. Nikos, uh, we can take some questions or you can make announcements or both. We have plenty of questions. By the way, Harry, these things that you described uh, are the routine in Europe. So I've been through all that. So I, you oh have my, my God. Sympathy. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't. Wait a minute. Before you take. Well, are there some quick questions I can take? Because I have another really super point to make. How about today, specifically for today, you finish all your points and then we have all the questions at the end. Okay. But let me say to people, stick around the question. Some of the questions are quite good. The reason why I call this a totalitarian state in Canada is the minute regulations on everything. It was total, your total life is at their disposal. And you live in fear, even as an American. My wife and I, since we had broken the rules, were constantly looking over our shoulder, at the shoulders. I told you I parked the car backwards. When I went to drop off the key uh, for the room that I wasn't supposed to have in a box by the office of the inn, I remember thinking, no, it's fantastically unlikely that anybody will see anything amiss in this. They're not going to remember. Hey, there was a, somebody else who rented that room, and well, how come you're driving? They don't, nobody knows all the people who are staying here and who rented the room. I can drop it off. It's not going to. And then I thought, you know what? That's what it's like to live under dictatorship. The best it gets is, oh, it's not likely I'll be caught. I think I'm going to get away with this. And it's such a contrast to being free and thinking, yeah, I'm walking to drop off the key in accordance with my rights and the proprietor's rights and the government is here to protect me from uh, force in the interference with that right. It was, you know, I'm sneaking around. My wife said, don't tell anyone we're Americans. Because America, you know, people say in line, they say to me, well, where are you from? I say, Naples, Florida. Hmm. Oh, what are you doing here? Well, a funeral service for a friend of mine. Okay. So you have to just, you can't just be free. You know, you can't be outspoken. You can't just be forthright. You have to stop and think, uh, is this going to get me in trouble? And I thought of not just the political implication, but the moral implication. This is what liars live with. They live with two states. He's going to find out, or I don't think he's going to find out. So there's never the sense of free, open walking in the sunshine. It's always you're in the shadow. And my wife and I were under stress. And I don't get under stress. I'm not a stressed person, but we had the feeling Big Brother is watching you. Even though it was a, a little thing, you know, it's only one little area, disease. Now, this raises the two things that I had trouble with were immigration and the control of the disease. And I thought I would say that um, the proper function of government is to protect you from force which means to protect you from criminals who are trying to take your stuff and kill you and to protect you from foreign invaders who are trying to take your stuff and or kill you. So what is the government's role in public health? None. None. No FDA for our agency, no CDC, no WHO for the UN. There's no role for government public health any more than there is in fashion. You are 
on your own. You use your own mind to judge your own health. Now, if somebody who is known to be infected with a contagious disease as an individual, we know this individual, goes out and spits on somebody else, that's criminal. That's force. That's a violation of rights. But the idea of having everybody fill out pieces of paper because they might have a disease even though they've been vaccinated and tested, that has nothing to do with the legitimate role in a, 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 for government in a known infectious guy in known contact or tempt, attempting it. Now, what about immigration, though? What is the proper role of government in, in immigration at the border? None. I would say its responsibility is to put up a sign, welcome to Canada or the US or the UK. That's its sole responsibility. It has no legitimate authority to regard people who don't happen to be citizens of that country as criminals and treat them as criminals or vet them to find out if they're going to commit a crime, which you can't find out, or to inspect them to see if they're healthy. No role. Uh, so that those are the wider topics that this episode key to me. Anti-reason means fear. Fear means lust for government control. Uh, being under the control of government means more fear, means you're constantly in the shadows because you can't obey all the laws. They're contradictory. You break one, you, uh, you observe one, you break another. Uh, and that the liar lives under dictatorship that he imposed on himself. That's why honesty is a virtue, or one reason why. Okay, Nikos. By the way, Harry, what you said that entering the country was in the discretion of the guards, if you hear stories about people who traveled, who were traveling to East Germany, that was one of the most common themes, that you, you would never know whether you'd get in till you're actually in. Now, of course, I'm not saying Canada is East Germany, but what you said there definitely... Yeah, the, it's elements the, of it. The principle of it is the same. Okay, so many super chats where to begin. Uh, if they initiate another year-long lockdown, is it time to get violent? The founding fathers would be... Okay, uh, YouTube is going to shut us down for promoting violence, but let's say... No, I don't think it is time to get violence because violence is worse. Once you get violence on the, on the scene, the left is going to win or else the fascist right, but we're not going to win. So, you know, there are people who say, well, you need to own guns because you need to be protected against the government if it tries. That's completely wrong. If people own guns, the, the, uh, it's the left or the fascist right that's going to win, not the advocates of freedom, the all 2,000 of us. So you better hope that the populace doesn't resort to violence because that is, that's the end. That's not going to help us. When it comes okay, to I'll the go. fist, when it comes to the fist, we lose. We want it to be the pencil or the pen or the keyboard. That's where we win. We can have a discussion about Ragnar Daneskill, but in another episode. Okay. I'll go first through the questions that are related to the topic and then to the questions that are general questions. Phil, thank you very much for your super chat. What is the best mechanism to alert the population they're being subjugated to totalitarianism? Or is it irrelevant if the population is seemingly already too exhausted by indoctrination to even care? Well, you have to work with what you've got, right? And the best thing to tell the poor serfs to raise their heads and stop kneeling before their masters is the novels of Ayn Rand. Uh, start with Anthem. That's the story of one man who wouldn't submit to a totalitarian, absolute totalitarian state. Atlas Shrugged is the story of um, fight against 
an incipient totalitarian America after the rest of the states had already gone, you know, the world had already gone totalitarian. So um, that uh, I'm really serious about this, that the, there's no question, but the best propaganda tool is Ayn Rand's fiction. I mean, it is conver everybody who's, uh, you know, now on our side to some extent got that way, I, I shouldn't say everyone, 90% of them by reading Ayn Rand's literature. Sorry, I'm very wow. tempted to ask you, Harry, then why aren't we, quote, on strike? Why aren't we? Because we still have freedom of speech. That's the dividing line. When you don't have freedom of speech, then, I mean, but, you know, it's really too late then because all you can do is run. You can't, you can't win by force of arms uh, against, you know, 0.001% against 99.999%. So uh, we still have freedom of speech and um, talk to people who have lived in actual dictatorships like Russia. Uh, we can do unimaginable things here like what I'm doing right now. I don't think I don't hear the black helicopters hovering overhead. OK, so more questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for your super chats. Apollo Zeus with a super cool name. Christopher, here's a very beautiful comment. I wanted to read this last, but I'll read it now because I don't want to forget it. So Christopher says, I took my parents 30 years ago to see Ayn Rand the sense of life. And my mother's reaction was, who is that Dr. Vince Wanker? I like him. So <laughs> for people who don't know, this is a documentary about the life of Ayn Rand and Harry appears in that documentary. Uh, Super Charles from Gale. Thank you for exposing Canadian culture. It is so difficult to find individualism here. And I would add same with uh, Europe. Okay, some more questions, not directly related to the topic, but many thanks to our Super Charter. So Michael asks, Will hyperinflation bring about authoritarianism? And if I may ask, do you see hyperinflation coming? Uh, I don't, but I uh, was wrong when I saw it coming, and I'm probably wrong when I don't see it coming. I'm not a good pro prognosticator, but I do have a, an understanding I got from your own book about why we haven't seen it already. And that is. Uh, to amplify on what he said, technology increases exponentially. Technology does not go up linearly because knowledge builds on knowledge. So, for instance, when you have a computer, all the sciences suddenly accelerate because they can do stuff with the computer to aid them in I remember I did uh, research as an intern in psychology and I used a hand adding machine to tabulate results. Can you believe that? And I remember the division, like dividing 17,222 by 345, just to take two numbers. You pull this handle. And then it would be word, a word, a word, a word, a word. And the first digit would come through, word, a word. It took about 15 seconds to do that on a hand-cranked adding machine. Now, of course, today you just put it into a spreadsheet or maybe they have something. You just ask uh, a, a woman whose name I cannot utter because she'll say, I don't understand. But her spelling is A-L-E-X-A. -E uh, you just ask her. And um, you get your answer without even entering it into a spreadsheet. So knowledge builds on knowledge. Technology builds on technology. Everything is accelerating. And production depends on technology. So the growth of wealth has outpaced the bureaucrat's ability to seize it. So that is uh, my explanation, which I think I got, I mean, I got the idea of it from your own. I don't know if he would agree with everything I just said, but the, to me, that explains it. Now, when they stop, when they're able to stop technology or corrupt it so much that it's no longer real, like climate science is now, then 
it's over, game over. But do you agree with the second part of the question, which was the actual part of the question that if it comes, is it going to bring, bring authoritarianism with it? Yeah. So you run to the bank and your money is not there, basically, with inflation. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I mean, just in what we had in the 70s, which I don't, in America, it didn't qualify as hyperinflation, but it was bordering on that. Uh, interest rate on the mortgage rates went over 20% at the height of it or maybe that was the prime rate. I mean, things got completely out of hand. And um, there was enough American spirit that we didn't really succumb to that. And uh, Ronald Reagan was elected to combat that. But it was really Paul Volcker who stopped it. But now, I think America's too far gone. My hope lies with England. Can you believe that? My hope England. lies with England or the UK, as we call it now, because there was a man named John Dewey in America who fathered the movement called Progressive Education, which is uh, the destruction of all the minds of the, the Ayn Rand wrote a, a piece on it called The Compra Chicos, which is one of the greatest things she ever wrote in nonfiction. I was going to quote from it today, but he was American. So he influenced America first, then it seeped over into Canada. And now I think it's coming into the UK. I know they have their equivalent of it, but there's a lag time. So I notice when I speak in England, forgive me for calling the UK England, but that's the way I was brought up. I notice much more literacy, intelligence, Effective intelligence. I don't mean ultimate up a uh, uh, high potential, but what you see, working intelligence uh, among the audience there compared to what you have here. And so my hope is with the foreigners. You know, in India, India, amazing. There's a tremendous respect for Ayn Rand. You see her quoted all the time as a as a real authority. They don't know they're supposed to hate her. <laughs> We were both hoping, me and Razi, that your hope in the UK you were getting out because of the Anron Center UK, but okay. Sure. I mean, that's a symptom and a contributing factor. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Next uh, super chat. Next super chat. It's one of the topics that when we create short clips, people are loving them because it's stories from your days with uh, Ayn Rand. So the question, super chat from Michael. Where is it? Sorry, I lost it. Here. Did Ayn Rand give off a certain energy when she walked in the room, as if you knew you were in no. the presence of a genius? No, she didn't give off energy. She was energy. So when she walked into a room or you entered a room with her, it was uh, like rays were coming out from her. I don't want to sound mystical, but I mean, she had charisma in spades. And the power of her gaze on you, you know, she had black irises, I think, you, you cut, not the pupil in the center, but the surround was dark, dark brown. And it made it look like she had this enormous, these enormous eyes. And they looked at you with that intentness. Uh, and it was, it could be very intimidating or very rewarding. Uh, she, um, I knew her best after late in life, around the time her husband was succumbing to dementia, and then after he died. And people who knew her from before, and I had only known her really from public appearances before. Well, that's not entirely true, but I knew her better than um, later. People who, who uh, one girl who knew her from earlier says she's like a gray spread of ashes compared to what she had been. And that gray spread of ashes was more dynamic, energetic, and charismatic than anybody else I knew ever. So, uh, yeah, she was, um, uh, you know, uh, genius did not is not what I got. That is, she was a genius, 
But that isn't what I saw. What I saw was moral certainty, passionate valuing and moral certainty. Uh, I think she was a genius and she made comments to me that I'm still taking the fruits of that it still flabbergasts me because there's so such a revolution in my understanding in this case of motion and rest if you can believe it or not but uh yeah the the intent of your question to answer is and how that's a phrase she would use and how next question uh, okay, we did the hyperinflation. Do you see objectives having an, an, effect, an effect at all on public policy? So not on the culture, specifically on yeah. public policy. Altruism seems to be alive and well. What seems to be alive and well? Altruism. Altruism. No, it isn't. Um, that's not public policy. That's public perception but um when i was growing up self was a four-letter word you had to apologize if you, people would would not refer to me you know i mean it was it was worse it was worse when i was growing up but um now there's a self-help movement self-esteem movement People talk about self-realization, self-actualization. Uh, the curse is off of it in a way it wasn't. Um, so I see that. But you want public policy? Ayn Rand ended the draft. Ayn Rand ended the draft in the United States. There was uh, a man, a graduate of Harvard, named Martin Anderson, who became converted to um, objectivism after he got his PhD from Harvard. He ended up as a Nixon advisor along with Alan Greenspan. And he proposed the ending of the draft. Nixon was in trouble because all the peace Nicks and so forth were really partially objecting to the draft. And Nixon ended it due to Martin Anderson, due to Ayn Rand. I mean, he wasn't just, you know, he didn't just read something. He was present in her company uh, from time to time in the company of her associates. I played poker with them once, for instance. And so, last... yeah, I see it there. And I'll tell you where it also shows up. It also shows up in um, business leaders who will not say they're objectivists and aren't, but got something for mine Rand, like the Uber guy, Kralnik, who had the Uber guy. He left. Had the Maxi to just break all the regulations and set up this thing and say, you know, you catch up to me, I'm going to do this. And uh, Mackey, the head of Whole Foods, I had dinner once with Billie Jean King. Do you remember Billie Jean King, the tennis player? She was the one who had this celebrated uh, match against Bobby Riggs, male against female. Uh, she was a leading woman, probably the top women's player in the world at this time. And she was an Ayn Rand fan. And she said, she gave me, <laughs> it's a little thing. She gave me the courage to turn down requests that I do charitable events. I thought, well, that's all, you know, you can get out of it. That's something. But there are a lot of, a lot of business leaders and uh, people in the arts who got their spines stiffened a little and got their ambition stoked by Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead. Last question. Is objectivism true or is it just a theory? It's a true theory. It's a true theory. Um, I'll give you the what converted an old girlfriend of mine to objectivism as an answer so that you understand what we're talking about when we say objectivism. This uh, woman 
who was then about you know 22, just graduated from college, had a relative who had become an objectivist. And this woman, the 22 year old, let's let's call her uh, Susan. Susan is expressing, you know, reservations. Her friend tells her existence exists. That's the first axiom. And Susan says, well, how do you know that existence exists? Look at this table. How do we know it's really there? Maybe it's an illusion. Maybe it's a dream. How do we know that it's real? How do we know it exists? And her friend said, hit your head against it. And Susan said, oh, and that was her conversion, in quotes, to objectivism. Because what we're talking about, is it true? Is it true that there is truth? No, it's not true there's truth. Is it true that theories can grasp reality? No, that can't grasp reality. That's a, those are contradictions. Now, not everything in objectivism is axiomatic, but the things that aren't are so close to like reasonable common sense once you abandon the superstitions that you know that you're like, you're not born in servitude to anyone. Your life is your own. Is that a theory? Or do you know that's true? You're going to be dead forever when you're dead. You've got the one life. Is, does somebody own that life? Are you their slave? Or does all choices, are, are you the guy making all the choices? You have free will. It's another major tenet of objectivism. Well, is that just a theory? Maybe we're determined to do everything we do, include, including say that we're determined to do what we do. Well, that's another one of the self-refuting statements. A determined mind can't say it's determined because it just says whatever it's determined to say. Uh, your life is your own. The good is to live it. The government should not treat you as a criminal if you're innocent. The government exists to protect your freedom. It's not your master. It's the police there to protect you from criminals and the military to protect you from foreign invaders. Is that like, oh, well, that's just a theory. How about art? We didn't get into art. Art is a selective recreation of reality. Art is a model of what the artist thinks life is like. He selects what he thinks is metaphysically important in life and puts that on canvas or tells a story illustrating it. Or if it's music, the emotions he thinks are central to his very being. Is that a weird, crazy theory? Or does that kind of make sense out of all the artworks you look at? So it's not um, like the philosophies that you have heard about, which are contrary to everything you thought when you were six. This is like the full flowering and systematization and rational organization of everything you already knew at six. And with this, I think we wrap up the longest episode, but also I have to say, Harry, that was my favorite episode, although you, I feel a bit guilty that I laughed so much with your uh, government craziness adventures. So today, uh, one of the reasons we need to wrap up is because in 10 minutes, the, the members of the Ayn Rand Center UK, uh, UK, they have their discussion group on the early Ayn Rand. And today, the, the essay, sorry, the, the story they're discussing is Think Twice, which is... Oh, that's one of my favorites. Yes. A great first line from Adrian. Pay special attention to what Adrian says when she comes on stage. Okay, so a big thank you, first of all, to our audience uh, and your questions. We really appreciate that you value this, uh, this program. Of course, to the Ayn Rand Institute, who is supporting us, a big thank you to this. Uh, make sure you follow the Ayn Rand Institute Global Facebook and Twitter page because we post clips with the highlights, the best of Harry, and also the best of the Yaron debates. And finally, a huge thank you to Harry 
Vince Wanger, Harry, thanks so much for being with us. Have we got the topic for next week or? We're yes, to radical, you? radical individualism. Radical individualism. Radical individualism. The topic for next week. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.